the Arvin Battalion was not there. We found out later that the Arvin Battalion had withdrawn from our flank without notifying us and had pulled back. And there we were with our left flank hanging in the air under attack from a sizable enemy force. At the same time, we started receiving heavy enemy fire from our right and sporadic small arms fire from the rear. I ordered Foxtrot Company to come forward. But unfortunately, Foxtrot Company itself had been pinned down in the open area to the right rear of Golf Company and was unable to move forward. So we had this small detachment of Golf Company up in a forward position, completely isolated, taking fire from all sides. It was a desperate situation. And desperate situations require desperate means. And it was at that point I have never been prouder of what the Marines and that forward of force were able to accomplish. Captain Vargas moved from point to point. He pulled his two forward elements back and formed a line of resistance to stop the enemy counterattack. And with excellent support from our gunship helicopters and our supporting arms, including naval gunfire and artillery, we were able to stop the enemy forward uh, counterattack on our positions and force them back far enough so that we could conduct a reasonably orderly withdrawal. Actually, it was a fighting withdrawal because we continued to be harassed by the enemy as we pulled backward. It was during this period that I was seriously wounded myself and was unable to walk. And I was pulled back by various members of my battalion, including Captain J.R. Vargas. At that point, uh, I, I recall General Weiss and Sergeant Major Milnar coming up and jumping in the trenches with us. And I'll never forget what General Weiss says, uh, how's it going? And I said, well, I think you better get the hell out of here because I just called some artillery right on top of us. And he kind of looked at me and, and said, have you really? And I said, yes. And he, <laughs> he spun around and just at that second, that's when Sergeant Major Milnar got hit with an RPG and some small arms. And he, I saw him go down. And then when General Weiss turned and jumped out of the trench to head back to help him, that's when he took three rounds right in the back. Uh, at this time, those rounds that I called in on top of us, thank God the maps are off a little bit because there were about 30 NVA right in front of us that uh, stood up and they were in the assault mode and those rounds, it was, I think it was the grace of God, those rounds landed right on those guys and wiped them away. Uh, I then turned around and uh, I saw the general and I said, I gotta get him out of here, but I told Morgan and Ferland to pull back. We're gonna have a, a good fighting withdrawal back I grabbed the, uh, the boss uh, by his flak jacket and drug him like a gunny sack. I remember going back in six times. Some people said I went back seven. I remember six and picking up six Marines. I'll never forget picking up this one Marine that had lost his arm and the arm was laying next to him and I picked him up, turned to take him out and I'll never forget him saying, Skipper, please give me my arm. So we went back. I got the arm and, and we got him back. I can't say enough for the actions of J.R. Vargas during that period. He moved from point to point, calmly giving orders to his men, reorganizing bits and pieces of his company that was left and bits and pieces of Foxtrot Company as he picked them up on the withdrawal to the rear. A barrage of rockets, artillery, rifle fire like I had never seen seemed to come from all directions. I had been in Vietnam six months, at the, five months at that point. I had been through several firefights. I had never seen the volume of, of ammunition, of, of overhead uh, artillery, rockets. Uh, uh, I had just never seen the, the volume of, of firepower that was being directed at that moment. Uh, it seemed that chaos began to break out. Uh, uh, some, I heard, I heard the, the word, pull back, pull back, pull back and there were troops uh, coming in all directions. Uh, our own troops were coming uh, at me as I was returning to my platoon. I got to the western side of Dido where the village narrowed to a waste of, narrow waste of land and it was fairly clear and there was a large bomb crater. 
I set up shop to treat casualties at that point, thinking that this was a good place for me to, to set up. There was some protection. I could stand up. I could get to the casualties. I could treat them. I could evaluate their wounds at that point. I wasn't there but just a few seconds before the first casualties, usually one at a time, arrived with various wounds, gunshot wounds, shrapnel wounds. Some of them, of them were not serious, uh, but most of the people I treated that I recall treating were in various stages of shock from blood loss. The interesting part that comes to me at this point in time and I recall is that most of those wounded were walking wounded, even though they had very serious wounds. That tells me that, or tells me at this point in time, that most of the wounded that got out had to have walked, or had to walk to get out. Also, a key player during that withdrawal was our air officer, a pilot, our forward air controller, Lieutenant Judd Hilton. He was one of the finest fighters on the field that day even though he did most of his fighting from F-4 Phantoms when he was trained for battle. I looked forward and saw Colonel Weiss coming towards me, and uh, he was limping. And it kind of surprised me. He approached me, and we both jumped in a foxhole together, and he says, I've been hit, and we've got to pull this unit back. And at that time, I looked down at him, and I, I noticed that he, he, had, he was bleeding from inside of his leg, and on, the, on his side, I believe he had an injury, so he'd been hit at least twice. Uh, he asked us to hang in there and have a delaying force in order to let the rest of the battalion forward elements uh, be able to uh, come back under some kind of cover. I was pretty, pretty scared, to tell you the truth. And I had uh, a young Staff Sergeant jump up named Pace. Staff Sergeant Pace with the intel section, he jumped up and says, Lieutenant, we're with you. And I said, oh, shit, now i got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Judd Hilton had been trained at the basic school, as all Marine officers are, and he knew infantry tactics. And he himself fired an M79 grenade launcher. And he picked up Marines and put them in position, and along with Vargas and other leaders who tre did tremendous jobs of, of responding to emergencies that occurred frequently during our withdrawal, because of all this action, we were able to pull back, bringing all our wounded with us. It was at this time our Corps lost one of its finest combat leaders, Sergeant Major of Marines, Big John Malnar. He ignored orders to withdraw and covered the evacuation of wounded Marines with his shotgun and hand grenades until he fell mortally wounded by enemy fire. Big John Malnar, who first saw combat as a 17-year-old at Saipan, Tinian, and Okinawa in World War II, who earned the Silver Star and two Bronze Stars in Korea, who earned another Silver Star, Bronze Star, and four Purple Hearts in Vietnam, who was on his third combat tour in Vietnam when he died to save his wounded comrades. Big John Malnor, a Marine Corps legend. He will be remembered as long as the Corps exists. Now, when we reached Dido, there we met Major Fritz Warren, our operation officer, who you heard from earlier. And Fritz had reorganized the Marines at Dido and at that point, I passed command to him because I was unable to continue commanding the battalion. And he organized the positions at Dido so that they could hold on for the remainder of that evening well into the next day. Uh, suddenly on our air frequency, we heard some kid whispering, hey, I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded here. I need help, I need help. And we, we thought it was some, somebody joking around first. Then finally we looked at it, and it was some kid named Otis Boss, we found out later his name. And he was actually trapped up in the town north of Dido, surrounded by enemy. They, were, they had actually walked over him a few times, he played dead. And finally, 